thank you for joining us for this uh, very important uh, topic that we have chosen today uh, for our discussion, which is really how telemedicine and telehealth is going to look for, uh, look to grow as we go forward. Today, we have seen, particularly with the pandemic being uh, being amidst the pandemic, there have been opportunities that have been emerging. Uh, largely which were there already in the market, but they were not able to find their true uh, sort of growth. Ed education technology is one of them. We have seen platforms like gaming, platforms like uh, OTT growing much bigger than they could even when there was no pandemic. And another sector that we think uh, is really a big sector that is going to emerge not just for now, but also going forward, it is uh, telemedicine or telehealth wherein uh, this is really uh, the digitization of the healthcare, the OPD, and also some other ailments which are common and don't really require for a patient to go to a hospital or should not be going to a hospital for that kind of consultation. So we have um, a panelists out here. We have uh, uh, Saurabh, we have Kiran, and we also have Rajat with us. And they're going to give us how this dimension of telemedicine has been now improving and growing uh, in different parts of the country. Uh, of course, um, Rajat is uh, more sort of got a bigger play in the tier two, tier three markets, while Saurabh and uh, Kiran, they have got uh, a play in the tier one as well as some in tier two markets. So it's going to be interesting to know where the telemedicine or telehealth has a uh, tele uh, uh, medicine or telehealth has a space is going to emerge in the years going forward. Uh, so let me start with you, Saurabh. Um, interesting space to be in. We are seeing that in markets like US, the telemedicine has been growing. Also from what we understood is that telemedicine is not been, it's not a very new concept. It's been there for a very, very long time where doctors were consulted through uh, digitally or through telephone as a simple medium or a tool of consultation for second opinion or for some other areas. What is your opinion on how telemedicine is likely to emerge? So it's something that we have all experienced now, particularly in the pandemic. And we have also realized the comfort and the convenience of having telemedicine around us as customers. What do you think is likely going to be going forward, going to be the impact of telemedicine or telehealth once the pandemic is really over, or at least people are able to uh, lose their fear of the pandemic? How are they going to use telemedicine as a tool for their um, uh, you know, medical consultations? Thank you, Ritu, for having me. Uh, so, the you know couple of points you know a lot of good points that you mentioned you know compared to you know what happened in the U.S. and what's happening across the globe. I think uh, obviously because of the the current pandemic, uh, because of the restricted movement of people, there has been an increase in telemedicine in India, and no doubt people have been uh, you know trying our services and other platform services to talk to doctors. What has happened also due to the pandemic is on the supply side as well, which is the doctors. They themselves also are not that comfortable seeing many patients. Although a lot of doctors are you know, on the front line, they are you know, seeing COVID patients, but there are many doctors who have decided to even you know, close down their OPD either because of their own or either because they are in the containment zone and whatnot. So, so on the supply side, on the doctor side, we are seeing a change in behavior where doctors themselves are you know, adopting technology. Right. So, so, so on both demand and supply side, this has been, there has been an uptake. Now to your question of you know, going forward, I think uh, going forward, what is going to define the timeline? And of course there is a blip, uh, which is increased. And now after once this you know, lockdown restrictions, as they are easing up, uh, as people go out more often, there will be a slight decline in telemedicine usage. And but the the new normal would be higher than the previous one for sure. Okay. Now, what is going to happen, uh, you know, going forward is is that the virus is going to define the timeline. You and I cannot define the timeline as to whether telemedicine you know will be adopted or not. So by that, what I mean is uh, to change user behavior, there are two things which are required. You know, either fear or incentive. Right. So right now, it's all about fear. So people are, you know, users are fear, fearful. The doctors are also, you know, scared. So I think as the restriction, in, you know, eases down, we're going to see how many people actually go out, how the economy picks up and, and whether this, this fear, you know, still resides among both users and doctors. And we are going to see that pace of decline. Obviously we are seeing today, but then 
it will settle at a at a new normal pace so so going forward i would say the usage is going to little bit decline as as people you know go out more often but uh, nevertheless there are uh, uh, you know uh, the behavior change has already happened to some extent so so there hasn't been any incentive per se to to do it but there has been a lot of fear but i mean if i were to add another layer to fear and incentive which is of convenience you know it's it's very convenient for a common ailment like let's say a cold and i mean today of course it's very fear some you don't know what this cold is coming from but i mean literally you know when you have some very common ailments you don't want to go to a doctor the only reason one has been going to opd for such ailments is because you know there is no other choice but to talk to a doctor if i were to get to talk to a doctor on a phone and he would say that okay look this is a virus which is anyway going around so just take this medicine for 5 days and you'll be done with it i would really not want to go to a doctor so my point is that do you think a uh, you know and any sort of disruption that has happened in the last 10 years whether it was e-commerce whether it was any eventually people found the convenience factor which really made them hook on to it so do you think convenience once they realize the convenience of it they are going to be more hooked to telemedicine than uh, they were previously yes definitely i think what you are what you said is bang on and uh, what is going to you know sustain the new normal which is a little less than the peak is is going to be convenience you know for sure where the people would uh, you know find uh, that more and more you know they don't need to visit a hospital uh, hospitals are sort of you know a catchment area as far as fear goes that you could be infected so even hospitals are also you know or even doctors are also suggesting to move to telemedicine so i think convenience will play a role definitely that's 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 going to happen in the long ho- in the long run we all hope you know as provider of telemedicine platform on librate we hope that your convenience you know should play a bigger role in in sustaining the new normal and what changes in librate have you seen particularly in the last uh, let's say uh, last i mean say start of 2020 i mean before like the pandemic march and then after pandemic march what kind of changes have happened on the platform so of course there is a there's a surge on there's a surge on the user side lots and lots of new new users have come on to librate and you know started trying out the online consultation service uh, but more than that what we have also witnessed is a rise of doctors coming onto the platform so uh, we have you know a huge team who are getting you know tens and thousands of doctors we have onboarded in the past sort of one month alone and they want to you know start their practice online so so that i think uh, is a is a huge shift in uh, in the mindset of doctors that we have witnessed and earlier you think doctors were uh, the sort of the uh, the roadblock they were the ones who were not adopting it as well fully now they have adopted it as they have adopted it now so so i wouldn't say there are roadblock but uh, you know if you if you go to let's say uh, uh, to to let's say a restaurant and you you know you are out in the market and you are going to a restaurant and you are just you know doing a take away and the restaurant itself says that hey you know why don't you order it before you don't have to wait you anyways have to take the food outside and you know you don't have to wait you can just call my number and ask right so it's that behavior shift that has happened from the restaurant which is a supply side which is now happening from the doctor side is they are saying hey you know why don't you consult me on librate or why don't you consult me on this platform right? right so doctors have put up their whatsapp you know they changed their profile picture they have changed their whatsapp status messages that hey you can consult me online so right. so so that shift i think is is dramatic uh, to the extent that uh, they are you know we are seeing this shift on the consumer side as well but there is another point you know which the regulations have come up so telemedicine even though government has been a strong uh, proponent of telemedicine in the past they have been using a lot of telemedicine services in their public health centers connecting you new know, remote with towns and villages to a central doctor but what has happened is now uh ministry of health and family welfare have come out with a complete set of guidelines which outlines very beautifully you know what is it that you can do what is it that you cannot do what is allowed what is not allowed and and uh, overall in nutshell the summary is that telemedicine is the way to go and government has come you know all hands saying that this is the future we we support uh, doctors with technology they can even do a consultation on whatsapp today they can do consultation on platforms like librate but uh, that has you know uh, been a tremendous push in terms of changing the mindset of doctors sure uh, rajat let me come to you now my upchar is 
uh, primarily is a model which is very more uh, 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 readily available in tier two and three and three markets. And now here, of course, we still sort of uh, been seeing overall from an overall perspective of the acceptance of technology and digitization is less than what it has been in the uh, tier one or the metro cities of the country. Now, where do you see a, a bigger uh, sort of market developing in the tier two, tier three markets for telemedicine? What opportunities are you seeing emerging over here? Are people really more now getting, and of course, you know, as Saurabh said, there has been a fear factor for which people don't want to go to their doctors and would rather have it at home. But do you see that in tier two, tier three, and also, of course, you know, in, in any at any point of time, tier two, three cities are, the, the hospitals are not overly jam-packed. They the, there is a good, really healthy relationship between the doctor and the patient. So how do you see the models emerging, business models emerging in these markets in telemedicine? So um, in tier two, tier three, um, you know, the bigger issue is with the, not just the convenience, it's the access issue. So when we talk about access, to, you know, you go to certain districts of the country, whether it's in Himachal or Uttarakhand or, you know, you, Eastern UP or Bihar or Jharkhand, you will see that in a district you have like four MBBS doctors or three MBBS doctors across the board. Like, um, and if you go to smaller towns, they just no MBBS or MD doctor, and forget specialties overall. So there's just no concept of speciality over there. So uh, now, um, like for example, I went to one particular district. I asked, "Ki yaar, yahan par doctor kahan hai?" So it's not that the user is not aware that the doctor that they are going to is not qualified. Um, but it's just that uh, the access is an issue. Um, availability is an issue. And uh, so as people become more comfortable with online solutions, people will move. So our, you know, the way we look at it is that uh, A, this opportunity forced a lot of people to come online and experience that teleconsultation does solve their problem. Yeah. So we close the loop and ask, Ki, yaar, aapka health outcome, health outcome jo aaya, wo positive hua ya nahi hua? And we see 80, 90 percent may there is a positive health outcome. Um, and people are improving. And we have also looked at, you know, international studies and everything, which says 85% cases may, you will be able to create a positive output, outcome by doing a teleconsultation. And that's what we are seeing in our data as well. So uh, I think what's happening is that people did not know that you can bina doctor ke paas jaye, phone pe theek ho sakta ya nahi ho sakta. And there are, uh, there are two parts of it. One part is, of course, the user behavior, which is like, my son's khasi, 50 or bachoki khasi se alag hai. So, my son's khasi is special as the doctor ko alag se dikhana zaruri hai. Or, wo alag se dawai likhe ga. Or, doctor kera hai, 50 logon ko ek hi dawai likhni hai. Kitne bhi hai. So, there is that user behavior. And on the doctor's side, there is economics involved. Uh, as to what he prescribes, what test gets done, where they get done. So there's a lot of that economics at a local level that's happening that basically, uh, you know, uh, pushes for the model that exists today. Uh, but what's what has happened here is that a lot of users are forced to come online. A lot of doctors are forced to come online. And that has basically changed the dynamics. Now the user knows that consultation online can be problem solved. So next time he has to go to a doctor, his questioning is that, why am I going to go online? And as an industry, it's our responsibility to make sure that that user gets an A-plus experience. Consultation, mein, the follow-up process, mein, sari mein. so we send them you know, relevant content. We have built journeys around different diseases. Um, just on cut. All of that has been mapped out. Um, so there are a lot of things happening. I think there is um, access issue at play in our case, especially. Right. Um, so they are coming up, uh, coming there anyway. 
but there are local incentives at play that basically stops them. There is local, there is awareness at the issue that is uh, also there. Uh, and this particular pandemic has forced people to come online, which I think ultimately is going to uh, help us in the long run because people will uh, adopt the platform saying, hey, this is all good. So why bother stepping out, waiting in line, going to a non-qualified doctor, um, paying money for med medicine that may or may not work versus coming online, talking to a qualified doctor, having double assurance that the, the things that he is advising will actually result in a positive outcome. So I think that's what has changed. Um, and it's a very fundamental shift that people are going to taste teleconsultation for the first time. Compared to, you know, even the products that we have for tier two and three are very different from tier one. Uh, so in tier one, the expectation is that people will do a voice consultation, a video consultation, because that's how they're trying to measure the quality of the doctor uh, from a user perspective and difference between physical and the, uh, you know, uh, physical experience versus a video experience. Compared that to our user, video consultation is not an expectation. And video consultation doesn't work because live connection, live uh, video call not available So we give them a video upload feature. It does work for them. So I think there's just some fundamental uh, shifts that have happened, um, which uh, by the government regulation also uh, that has helped in the overall situation. Um, and I don't think this is going away now. The, pen, the box has been opened, Pandora box has been opened. Uh, people have experienced what a higher quality consultation looks like. Um, and they are not going to settle for anything less. So it's just more of us as an industry pushing people to experience this uh, level of consultation um, across millions and millions of users. And once they experience that, they're not going to go back. Sure. Okay, let me come back to you again on another important question, but first I'll go to Kiran. Now, Kiran, um, you know, uh, what I'm seeing is, uh, so I'm going to draw a parallel with another industry here. So now, health tech, and you know, I asked this from Saurabh also, that, you know, sometimes the roadblock is in the person who has to adopt this technology. So in education technology, we realized that it was the teacher who was not as keen to adopt education technology in the classroom. And that is why, you know, the all effort of digitizing education for children was not sort of giving the results that were expected to come. However, with this pandemic, every teacher had to go and adopt this technology, prepare classes online and do everything. So now my point is that what, how has the behavior of the doctors shifted during this particular time of the pandemic to be able to give digital technology as a solution or a digital medicine as a solution? And do you think for them, I mean, you know, once of course doctors are enabled to be able to do it and they are more keen on doing it, the patients would automatically shift there because they are only, it's all about a doctor-patient game at the end of the day. So do you think now doctors have shown more readiness than ever before, um, you know, and earlier? And secondly, <clears throat> with doctors being now able to sort of, doctors becoming more important to the entire thing and adoption, how do you see telemedicine evolving? I mean, you know, I'm sure you have to do as a platform fight that you have to do a doctor. You have to do a doctor. And you know, what kind of earning can the doctor expect? Do you think it's an extra spin for him or is it going to eat away his, his or her time from, you know, what they have been spending and they can earn on one to one? So, all these things from a doctor's lens, if I have to look at the situation, if you can give us an idea of that. Sure. <clears throat> So let, let me take a step back in this scenario, right? So I'll give you an example from my past life where I was in the US managing telecommunications, right? Smartphones. And I've seen uh, teleconsulting almost, I would say, eight years ago in the US. Right. right? And, and I was managing a, a smartphone called Palm Centro, which was doctor's favorite smartphone, right? In the US. I mean, this was, I'm talking eight years ago, right? And, and we were selling like hotcakes to doctors in the US eight, nine years ago, Palm Central. And the only reason they were using it was not for consultation, only for appointments. Okay. 
right? And even then, uh, there was a huge barrier for doctors to adopt technology. This, this I'm talking about in a mature world. Now, if you take a couple of years fast forward, right? When we started the platform, when we started uh, saying we want to provide teleconsultation, so our business is slightly different from uh, Rajat's and uh, Saurabh's. So we are a B2E company, right? Business to employees company. And when we started our platform for teleconsulting, one of the main requirements was, like you rightly said, doctors, right? Now, unless there is supply, there is no, unless there is demand, there's no supply, right? In this scenario, it's like a classic, if, if I have to start a online dating website, right? Do I bring the women first or the men first? Correct. Right? <laughs> so in this scenario, I mean, what we did was we took a slightly more uh, difficult approach where we went ahead and acquired a teleconsulting company. And today uh, we have doctors full time on our payroll. So okay. we don't outsource to doctors, right? And, and when we started out uh, getting doctors full time on our payroll, we don't judge doctors based on the number of consults. They don't get paid a number of consults. They get paid only on the quality of the consults. After every consult, they have a rating. Now, going back to what, what you mentioned, right? What uh, Rajat was mentioning, it's, it's, it's the customer, right? For Rajat's customer, the needs are different, which is the reason why he's, he was able to build the demand. For Saurabh's customer, the needs are different. He's able to build a demand specific to that customer. For our customer, the needs are completely different, right? When I'm talking about an employee, <clears throat> they need 24 seven support, like, like a nurse line. They need uh, like, uh, they don't care about video consultations because most of these are younger uh, population who are who would like to chat more than voice or video. So when we enabled all of this, there was a in, already an increased consultation, an increased demand in terms of teleconsultations, but that has changed drastically, right? In the last one and a half month, where we've seen almost 200, 300 percent increase in number of consultations, primarily because of our main client, I would say, right? I know I'm going off of your question a bit, but our main client corporates, I would say, uh, three months ago, when we went and pitched in teleconsultation, right? Saying it's available 24 seven, it's MBBS qualified doctors. They said, no, face to face. Right. Right. And, and today, uh, in the last one and a half month, we've signed up almost 800 companies who said, we don't want face to face, we want virtual consultation. So it's, right. a, it's, a, it's a complete shift in how people are thinking about this, right? I, I, I know it wasn't, Rome wasn't built in a day, right? So it's, it's at least the right step is being taken in that direction, right? Wherein now <clears throat> companies like ours, right? All the digital health companies are starting to focus more on the demand. Right. Right. So the demand is growing. Right, where people even, uh, even like, for example, even users that we knew, right, 45 years and above users, we thought would never be comfortable chatting with a online doctor, but they have no other means, right? This is like, they don't have another way to do it. So this is like, this is the only out, uh, way that they can chat. So, so the demand is changing. Now, if we are able to do a good job in that first one or two, consultations that they do, then we are confident that they will come back saying, yeah, this is convenient. This is simple. And more importantly, this is super fast than going and waiting for a simple cold or cough or because 80% of those consultations are basically for primary care. Right. right? right. And now that the doctor, all the demand has gone up, right? You won't believe the number of doctors who reached out saying that, uh, hey, is there a platform or is there a, can we use your technology to consult our patients online? In the right. last, I mean, a lot of doctors are reaching out, right? So, so it, I, again, going back to my classic case of online dating, right? Which is you bring men or women first, right? In this scenario, it's the demand. And, and when, when doctors are able to see that clients are getting used to that, and they have the convenience, doctors will automatically come come to the platform. I mean, they will have to adapt. If I mean, humans are good at adapting, they will have to adapt to the new ways of consulting patients. I mean, a very simple example in my own case, 
right? My pediatrician, a very, very well-known pediatrician uh, with, in Hyderabad, face-to-face -face only. Right. In the last one and a half month, he's done more teleconsultations than face-to-face -face consultations. And it was, it was a very, very, uh, I mean, it was a, it, it was a very tedious process, but there, he being such a senior doctor had adopted to teleconsultation. So I would say demand is first and then the doctors will definitely follow. Right. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know, this brings me to another important area of concern. So sort of, let me ask you this, you know, uh, for doctors, you said that a lot of doctors have onboarded on the Liberate platform um, uh, right now, particularly during the pandemic times. But do you really feel that in some ways, doctors feel that this will be counterproductive for them in the long run? I mean, let me give you an example of the restaurant industry. So while every restaurant today is giving a takeaway or it is giving a delivery, but they still feel that if they continue to do this in short run, it's okay when you know it's a survival game. But in the long run, if they try to do something like this, it's going to eat into their real business, which is dining in. So now, do you feel that doctors also are going to, at some point of time, be concerned that this might actually eat into their real business where they get the piece? You know, obviously, when you when they use your platform, they uh, they have to share some kind of commissions with you, and you know, obviously, there is a cut everywhere. So do they? And I mean, that is one part of it. Do you feel that it, they feel that overall it might be counterproductive in the long run? But in the, in the short run, of course, it's adding to everybody's income. But also at the same time, do you feel that uh, hospitals are likely to get into this game themselves? You know, they might say that, okay, we also run a digital OPD and we also run a physical OPD. Um, and, you know, therefore that adds to our revenues. So how do you think the market, I mean, you know, what is the market economics or the business model economics like? telemedicine so uh, you know there are two questions i'll answer the first question first on the doctors the commission and other things so there are two kind of platforms that exist today in telemedicine uh, one uh, which is like a true platform wherein any doctor can register and any users can find those doctors and consult with them right, right. then there is a second kind of a platform which is actually not a platform but what they are is they are getting users and they are saying you can consult any of the doctors for like a specified fee, say 400 rupees a month. You can consult any doctor and they don't show the name of the doctors. So it's like an aggregator so, platform. So it's an aggregator, but it is actually not an aggregator. It is disintermediating the doctor. So okay. that platform is actually worse for a doctor. Where right. Today, if yeah. I give the example of a, of, a, of a restaurant that you talked about, Similar to say a cloud kitchen, where right. you don't know there is a name that pops up and you don't know that well, restaurant or there is no physical location to it. So now what is happening is that platform is actually doctors need to be really beware of that. Hey, my name is not there. I am now working as a contractual employee or as a consultant where people are paying the fees and then I am being assigned a patient. Right. right? So, so that uptake in demand side, which is the user side, if there are platforms like these doctors need to stay away. Hmm. That's that's point number one. The second point is Liberate is not that platform. So in Liberate, doctors can register. When a user pays a fee, they actually select a doctor first, and then they go and pay the doctor's fee. So selecting a doctor first means I know which doctor I want. So we are a very neutral platform. Now coming to the third point of the fees part. So I can't say for other platforms, but for Liberate. We don't eat into doctor's revenue. Right. So let's say the doctor's fees is 500 rupees consultation fee. The user sees doctor fees 500. There's an internet handling fee, which is 10% of doctor fees, say 50 rupees. Total is 550. So it actually says that doctor's fee 500, library fees 50, total 550, user pays 550. In fact, that money goes into a nodal account which is a non interest bearing account library doesn't earn any interest on that 550 rupees 500 goes directly automatically to doctor's bank account and 50 goes to our bank account. Okay. So, so, so there is no eating into commission of a doctor per se. So that's the first, uh, first part. Uh, 
the second question was uh, if you if you can recall yeah, the or... second question was really how will the business model evolve because you know i also feel that yes. hospitals like apollo hospitals uh, coin yeah so so on the hospital side in fact many hospitals have now adopted some kind of a platform either librates platform or they have come up with their own apps and web based solutions and they are offering this opd consultations to all the all their database of patients right so it doesn't really matter whether they use librate or they use their own platform or they use a third party what they are doing is many hospitals have now adopted this technology now what is going to happen in the commission and the business model of a hospital a hospital runs on the it doesn't run on opd if you ask any hospital it doesn't run on opd it runs on ipd right. ipd is the inpatient department mm. so there is a conversion which happens from opd to ipd so now what is you know there are you know obviously conflicting theories behind it but uh, what could happen is that there can be a lot more opds that will happen mm. because of the convenience factor that we talked about that even for a small thing which i used to avoid the visit earlier now i can just consult so there is there can be an increase in opds at the same time there can be a decrease in opd to ipd conversion there could be so so i think uh, on the on the doctor side uh, on the hospital side uh, only time will tell but uh, given where we are today my guess is the business should increase of a hospital because of the convenience factor that ailments which were not being taken care of earlier now they have the opportunity to talk to a patient and uh, my guess is that should increase from a hospital perspective if they are adopting a digital technology which i see a lot and lot of hospitals have started to adopt irrespective of the size whether it is you know a, a india wide chain or a city specific chain or even a single speciality i'm i'm seeing about i'm hearing from our partners at hospitals that we work with that future outlook is that it is going to increase it is not going to decrease sure uh rajat um, you know i'm going to ask you this question and then we also see a lot of questions coming from our audience we'll take those also alongside um so you know my point is what are the trends you have noticed in the telemedicine in tier 2 and tier 3 cities what kind of uh, services are the customers taking the most is that profitable for the business model at large i mean you know particularly that uh, that level of service that that payment uh, points that uh, the the price points that you are charging does that make the the model viable or do you think the model requires some other uh, users so for example you know sorry mention from opd to ipd so how for you this model is going to transgress to become more uh, you know more of a tool where the economics works right for you uh so first i think i'll uh, at also address uh, what sarav was talking about the two models of teleconsultation uh i think uh, there there is a fundamental problem with health and education industry um nobody is focused on consumer so education mein bacche par focus nahi hota uske parent pe jo pay karne wala hai uske teacher pe un pe focus hota hai uske hisab se model decide hota hai healthcare mein bhi patient pe focus kam hai डॉक्टर पे ज्यादा फोकस है ऑल फार्मा कंपनीज आर फोकस ऑन डॉक्टर ऑल हॉस्पिटल आर फोकस ऑन डॉक्टर्स एंड सब्सिक्वेंटली ऑल टेली कंसल्टेशन प्लेटफॉर्म हैव कम अप विद फोकस ऑन डॉक्टर तो आई एक्चुअली एस्क्राइब सो यू नो देर प्लेटफॉर्म दैट आर डूइंग डॉक्टर डिस्कवरी राइट कि मुझे इस एरिया में पलमोनाजिस्ट ढूंढना है या कार्डोलॉजिस्ट ढूंढना है and they basically go and find that and uh, you know connect with them to visit visit offline or now in our days also do online but our core customer has a different problem our core customer is a, has a problem that he wants to talk to someone who has a mbbs degree can provide a timely response if you have to book an appointment uh, i have seen platforms where you get an appointment after like 10 hours 14 hours 18 hours um two days later and in our case we have to give the response within a 30 minute window so ours is more uh, built towards keeping patient in focus versus the doctor in focus yes um we will have much higher efficiency per doctor so 
uh, we don't need that many doctors on the platform as you know you would need in a marketplace which is like i have to have everybody on the platform uh, so there is going to be an impact on the doctor there are tons of jhola chaps they don't need to exist they need to go away from the business um and that will happen because of a platform so if those doctors are afraid they need to be afraid because jhola chaps in our mind are not really we're doing value add they are basically wasting people's money they are creating bad health outcomes for the patient and they need to go away right so yes if those doctors are afraid they are creating noise they need to create noise they should be afraid because our platforms will basically reduce um, the money that they earn because of higher quality of service that we are providing sure. in terms of um, you know coming to the question that you asked us uh, of uh, how do the business model works so we basically stick to what works in the behavior tier 2 tier 3 behavior which is not paying the consultation for the consultation so we don't charge anything on the consultation side while we pay our doctor so we pay per consultation to a doctor we don't charge anything on the consultation side but we do send the medicines uh, sell the medicines uh, we do uh, the lab test um, and we provide very very limited discount so our theory is that hey if we are providing a plus consultation um, a plus service then they will still buy the medicines via our platform um, even when we are providing less discount compared to you know other medicine websites that are out there and uh, so far uh, what we are seeing is that uh, that theory is uh, largely true of course it's not going to be true for 100% people are going to be looking at deals but people over time as they become comfortable with platform they keep coming back uh, to the same uh, to the platform talking to the platform uh, talking to our doctor and they start converting on our platform so after two consultations after three three consultations they get bound to you know convert buy medicines from our platform um so are we give like 5% 10% margins not much uh, but we do make sure that we follow up we take care of the customer provide a positive health outcome that is our goal ki hame customer ko positive health outcome dena hai right uh, and uh, at a unit economic level um, when we look at our uh, consultation business very close to becoming a uh, break even um, which covers the cost of teleconsultation cost of shipment of medicines whatever margin there is in medicine uh, it basically comes starts to cover at least that uh, business unit that provide that is directly involved with providing not the other engineering and this and that not all of that cost but at least coming to that point so i think uh, the model is there um, it has taken us a couple of years to figure out because uh, we tried charging consumers from 9 rupees to 249 rupees um, 51 rupee 101 rupee 49 rupee all kinds of price points for doctors that are like um, the top pediatrician top gynae charging 2000 rupees per consultation and we subsidize it for the customer saying ki yaar inke liye log 9 rupaye pay karne ke tarike liye taiyar hain ya 49 rupaye pay karne ke liye taiyar hain and we got conversion rates like 0.07% um and we are like ki yaar ye hamara consumer to nahi pay karega yes there is a different tier one audience which liberate craft or other companies are uh, attracting but our core consumer is not going to pay for it. we have to make them in uh, tier 2 tier 3 markets uh, ye homeopathy or ayurveda may be is there a good opportunity yeah so ayurveda then homeopathy we get lot of request uh, we of course make sure that they talk to qualified uh, bms or bhms doctors um, they are not talking to a doctor that um, is a doctor because uske pita ji bhi doctor the uh, which happens a lot in tier 2 tier 3 so our core objective is fairly clear uh, and we feel that uh, you know um, when you provide high quality service you provide provide efficiency then the low quality service providers do get washed out in any industry and that is will happen in healthcare as well uh, you cannot protect them you should not be protecting them um, 
but yes for the high quality providers you have to figure out the right unit economics so that they are earning at least uh, at same level as they were before or even higher than what they were doing before because they have aligned with your platform um, so that is something that is still um, you know we're discovering as we go uh, but the good news is that we are close to at, at least at the unit economic level where the direct cost and what we are coming close to that unit uh, that um, way of life ki it chal jayega model right um kiran let me ask you this you know obviously now people want what uh, face to face it virtual we've sort uh, seen a trans uh, transformation happening but you know i know that in case of a doctor there is always in at least in the mind of a tier 1 and i'm sure not just in tier 1 tier 2 tier 3 the doctor is very critical to the whole thing so there is always a certain doctor or by the certain name i want to meet for a certain ailment and you know his time is always valuable he is always a busy doctor now how do you meet that need of the customer in telemedicine you know where it, if he wants to only meet with that customer and i mean both saurav and kiran can really take it up kiran can start that you know how do you sort of address that situation of the customer where he says i want to meet that doctor and i'm happy to pay x y z for it uh, for telemedicine let me let me start Uh, and then sort of uh, you you are more closer to this than i am right from a be a consumer point of view um so so our our focus is very simple uh, uh, right i mean we're not going to make 100% of the customers happy right i mean as as a product guy you can't make every customer out there happy when you're building a product right you're building for a certain segment and you know you'll leave out a certain segment out right and no matter what kind of a tech what kind of an incentive what kind of a motivation that you provide that uh, superstar or rockstar doctor he or she will always be late right because they are always running back to back yeah yeah, right? yeah yeah or they will end up having an assistant consult for all of this right so rather than breaking our head on trying to solve for a problem which is there for 20% of those population right why our focus is to solve for the 80% of the population where there is primary care issues right i mean but yeah if 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 i have to go to a uh, for a thyroid consultation with that specific endocrinologist right no matter what kind of a tech what kind of a platform what kind of a solution that you provide they will consult the same person right so so we're not trying to uh, solve for all of those corner cases we are trying to solve for 70% right now which is because the market going back to your earlier question right <clears throat> india i mean this is this is this sounds cliche right which is healthcare infrastructure the the supply of this in the healthcare infrastructure and the demand is there's a huge gap right, right. now even if with teleconsultation with all the tech platforms every startup out there even if they are providing tele consultations the market is so freaking huge right right that there is there is enough pie for everybody right if you look at an average indian right i mean if if you look at from a consultation i'll just give you one small stat from our own point of view right a person consults at least twice in 6 months this is not including the follow ups not including the dependents right so if you look at it the population we haven't even penetrated uh, 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 i mean even we haven't crossed even the early digits of those numbers right so the market is big enough where i i don't think we should focus on trying to solve those complex problems rather than trying to solve for the 80% of the problems which would help ease up the infrastructure for those specialists to focus on because if i'm an endocrinologist if out of 100 consultations if 80% of those consultations are could be solved online by someone else my time is better spent on those yeah. typical cases right so sort of, i i don't know what what's your take on it no i think uh, you know you're right the 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 issue is that there are you know two kind of users who who know a particular doctor like what ritu said that i want to consult with only this doctor versus say i want to consult with i'm i'm okay with any any doctor so so i think as long as you 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 know uh, the, the the role of a platform is as long as you have all kind of doctors there on the platform the user has the choice 
now that choice can be met or choice cannot be met so for example you want to talk to uh, say dr you know narish trehan of medanta the medicity then of course there are only you know x number of ways or very like maybe like one or two ways that you can talk to him right so if you are very very particular about a particular doctor which is which a lot of many you know patients would want to have their opinion then i think it's a is is boils down to that single individual as to how accessible he is you know how many working hours he has and within that certain time he can see only x number of patients so so i think uh, the as you rightly said the role of technology per se is very limited in that use case like you can't we can't like you know have like left part of the brain talking to one user and right part of the brain right like talking to another user that that cannot happen but what can happen is if we can multiply doctors presence using technology so for example if if a particular doctor is staying out of delhi he is sitting out of delhi he can consult a patient across india so 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 i think multiply the doctors presence across various geographies is possible not necessarily within the same uh, you know time space sure okay so i'm now going to take i be getting lots of questions from audience i'm going to also involve them so let me start with ismail sayed uh, can we give him the audio please shalini if you can pass on the audio to ismail hi there everyone can you all hear me yes i'm calling from dhaka and i'm really honored to be part of your event and uh, kudos to all of you So uh I believe I asked a lot of questions I'm sure time is really short so let me just boil it down to three I think one for each of you guys um let me just go right into it my interest is uh will telemedicine tort laws related to privacy similar to HIPAA in America will it be more lenient by 2021 what are your predictions uh question number 2 what are the core concepts of continuity of care beyond the initial telemedicine se- session that you guys would think is a value proposition. And I think the last question probably really important especially from my point of view uh from the Indian context why do you think doctors are only stakeholders in health startups instead of key shareholders like C suite positions meaning core decision makers in uh healthcare business. So that's it from my side. Thank you. So I'd like to start with you. Uh so i think i'll take the the you know uh, on the data provide on you know, privacy side uh the whole uh, as of now there aren't uh, you know much guidelines but almost all technology companies in india they follow the information technology act and as per that there are a lot of you know data privacy guidelines and regulations that exist so as a platform we follow and comply with the information technology act hipaa per se is not applicable in in india right now but we try to uh, follow the best practices and i'm sure other digital healthcare platforms you know would also follow the best practices if you know left to them right now so as of now there is no central government regulation but i think the new telemedicine guidelines it talks a lot about data privacy as well uh, there's a you know complete section on on that as well how data privacy and insecurity needs to be you know maintained so as platforms who understand the uh, data privacy across not just in india but you know outside so in, U- in europe you have gdpr in us you have hipaa so you can you know we are trying to you know comply and take the best practices to as much you know as possible at our end and uh, that's what you know i can say on the data privacy side if you are question on whether it will be a little bit relaxed by 2021 i don't think so that laws will be a little bit relaxed i think laws are going to become more stringent and stringent and there will be you know i i it's it might be no wonder i i wouldn't wonder if there is a separate data privacy guideline only for telemedicine which is a sub sub part of the complete telemedicine that has been launched it, it, there is a detailed guideline on that as well i think uh, it's going to get uh, stricter and stricter as uh, the access to telemedicine opens up i leave the rest to the other guys rajat you want to take up some question uh sure um so i can take on the continuity and the shareholder side so a uh, quick comment on the shareholder i think it's just the uh way the doctor education happens they over time you know become very very risk averse and very very specialized 
so uh, so when businesses are set up around it they are usually not part of it and that's why they are uh, not shareholders in such efforts although that has changed over last two years quite a bit um so a lot of people have been seeing a lot of companies um, uh, at least in india that have been formed by the doctor so that has changed i think that's there um i and i think it's for the better over time we think it will change much uh, more because it, they have more domain knowledge compared to other people coming up and building on it uh, on the continuity of care side i think um, you know uh, there was a discussion of hospitals doing telemedicine earlier telemedicine earlier uh, a lot of a large part of the reason why hospitals uh, before pandemic started doing telemedicine was the continuity of care uh which is post op uh, you know the linkage is break and the doctor uh if hospital is unable to capture revenue from the patient in terms of the medicine lab tests etc um especially when you have you know bypass surgery or anything so they started a lot of hospitals started or adopted teleconsultation to take care of that continuity of care kind of a uh, kind of a model uh, and capture that revenue uh but in case of teleconsultation it's a much uh, more simple and more straightforward process um and uh, has higher impact of course because you when you think of it you know pretty much there are 12 13 diseases which are large 80 90% of the chronic diseases whether it's pcod whether it's diabetes um heart related stuff a bunch of issues and there are lifestyle changes that are associated with each of them um so if you can egg them on and what we have done in our platform is basically once we identify based on his reading pattern based on his consultation pattern that hey the person suffers from x then we basically start sending them that content that will improve his life and lifestyle um and reduce the chances of that episode happening again um and also start we have started tracking certain metrics so that person can feed in ki uska glucose level kya hai uska bp kya hai etc etc so that we can start um, creating more of custom advice versus trying to do a generic advice flow so i think continuity of care will be an important part overall uh, from a telemedicine platform perspective and it's actually much more easier for uh companies like us to do versus uh, for doctors to do because uh you know they just don't have the bandwidth for it sure uh kiran you want to add something yeah so so just on the doctors as stakeholders right as my i think that's a great question primarily because i'm not a doctor by education right but i'm running a healthcare technology company right so completely cognizant of our uh, capabilities and what we can what we cannot so one of the things that we did very early on is uh, to get domain experts right i mean as stakeholders so uh, within our company we have almost three senior doctors i mean cardiologists who are stakeholders there's dr varaprasad who of padmashri varaprasad who's again a senior doctor uh, one of the vaccine uh, vaccination companies and at a c level we have something we have a new uh, a different role called chief medical officer right so every little code that goes into the platform every little decision every little uh, 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 product that we do has to be signed off by the chief medical officer right because at the end of the day a bunch of engineers cannot actually cater to the health tech right to your question yeah absolutely doctors are important and we 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 look for them to actually give us a clearance on everything that we do right and uh, from a continuity of care point of view continuity of care can only come if the medicine is personalized right and and today if if a 36 year old with a family history of diabetes who smokes or may not smoke and is taking less than 2000 steps per day right my follow up is completely different from everybody on this panel right um, so everybody's medical uh, footprint is is different and that can only be achieved if we are being able to track the data continuously normalize it and more importantly if we are able to provide personalized 
recommendations only then there is interest for people to come back and use it by way of which you collect more information by way of which you personalize it more right so that yeah continuity of care comes in a little later before you build the trust of the user to come to the platform first right uh, the next question is from deepak kriplani uh, can we give him the audio please is deepak online okay so his question is really as a doctor my patients have my phone number and i am already okay this question is not complete i think the question uh, kind of broke into the other line uh, as a doctor my patients have my phone number and i'm already doing telemedicine how would liberate help me further yeah so uh, that's actually for sorry yeah i think uh, you know there are you know if you read the fine print of a telemedicine guideline uh, there are a lot of things that a doctor uh, needs to get uh, you know protected from so for example the complete uh, communication history uh, the prescription history uh, you know if patient says something and you say something else so from a medical legal perspective a library really protects you because whether it's a text consultation which is like a whatsapp style com communication or is an audio call which is like talking to a phone or it's in a video call all of these three are recorded and stored for the doctor to refer at any point of time in the future so from a medical legal perspective it is very important as per telemedicine guideline doctor is responsible the telemedicine consultation which is say an audio video or a text is equal to an in person consultation so the laws that govern in person consultation for a doctor are actually equally applicable to a telemedicine so it's very important that as a doctor you protect you you are protected from a medico legal perspective the second aspect uh, you know uh, which liberate helps uh, is basically managing the patient queue so you know a platform like whatsapp is like an over ended open ended you know chat conversation there is no start and there is no close and uh, what is going to happen on on librate a platform will give you an opportunity that okay you have a 15 minute window or a 30 minute window where a patient can consult with you and that's the consultation that gets over there is a closure to it there is a prescription attached to it so the whole workflow of a doctor is mapped online using technology the third part is re with, with regards to the payment so as doctors adopt lot more technology and lot more you know patients online what is going to happen to your finances how are you going to manage you know how much fees you got uh, if there is a payment gateway that you are using yourself sending a link on paytm some guy you know some user is comfortable not with paytm but say with google pay or some other platform online you know uh, platform to receive money you will have to keep track of everything what is going to happen in across so what library does it aggregates everything at one platform irrespective of user can pay through paytm credit card debit card net banking google pay phone pay any platform they can pay but as a doctor you receive your consolidated money in your own bank account there is an online system of ledger which says okay this particular patient this was the name this was the date this is the amount and everything there is compliance with regards to tds that we do as well so we have the pan number of your the doctor we you know ensure that your forms are duly filled the tds you can see online by logging to the tds site the government site that your tds has been paid and things like that so so you know practically from uh, three perspectives the library can be helpful one is from a medico legal you know perspective second is through the whole patient user experience perspective and third is with regards to the finances sure thanks uh, we have the third question from prashant choudhury uh, if is he around can we pass on the audio to him yeah uh, can you hear me yeah can you guys hear me yes we can yeah. hear you prashant so uh, basically it's uh, related to uh, the uh, how do you uh, see consumer adaptation of ai based telemedicine apps in the future so basically considering government has released that ai based apps can uh, not counsel the patient or uh, give medicine to the patient but they can uh, as assist the doctor but uh, um, how do you see the future that uh, how ai can you know be helpful in that or the adaptation the uh, consumer will be willing to 
uh, take a medicine or take anything from uh, you know the AI based app. Are you uh, addressing this question to anyone in particular? No, it's open, so anybody can. Kiran, you want to take it up? Sure. So, so when I say when you say AI, right, Prashant, uh, this is already happening across multiple platforms, right? Uh, and and for example, at Eaton Care, right, when when a, when you actually reach out to a doctor, doctor already has a summary. I mean, uh, of every information that they need. So there is no history taking again and again by the doctors. They already have a summary, a cheat sheet kind of an approach, which is a combination of your past medical information, combination of your uh, activity, combination of your risk, combination of your past prescriptions, lab results. So they already have a cheat sheet, which is which is based on an AI engine where they just look at it and say, okay, this is the benchmark of the uh, customer who's actually reaching out to me and they're able to consult better from there on, right? Now there are uh, there are further AI bots that are being built in wherein the the initial few discussions, right? Like the back and forth happens on a bot and then gets bifurcated to different doctors based on the request or a query or the primary concern, right? So that is that is already happening across multiple platforms, right? The, the the critical AI that is needed now is while we only have limited doctors, those limited doctors already were stretched in an offline wor world. They are now coming to online and in an online world, they only have limited time because they also have to manage offline once the lockdown ends and all of that. How can you make the consultation more efficient, right? Instead of taking five minutes, can they start off immediately because they have the entire cheat sheet because they have all the data come concerned? That is that is where most of the companies are focusing. That is where we focus to make to help the doctor consult much faster instead of taking five minutes taking history again back over and over. Sure. Uh, the next question is from Jagannatha Venkata Ramaya. Can we pass on the mic to him, please? Okay, his question is that telemedicine is a great boom uh, for 50 years of space age. Um, Shine project at International Space University Strasbourg is one of the best space hub based new normal for health surveillance disaster management. Um, I don't see the question really. I see this is a point that is made. Hello. Are you online, Jagannatha? Yes, yes madam. Yes, madam. Thank you. Thank Go you. Ahead. Uh, at the outset, uh, I, my greetings to all the uh, distinguished panelists. Thank you. Uh, I have raised a few focused uh, points. Uh, that is, uh, when I am going through this healthcare uh, system, being a public health engineer from IIT Kharagpur uh, way back in '82, uh, my quick uh, response would be. If today, uh, the entrepreneurs, especially those who are uh, stakeholders in telemedicine, uh, if you look at the indigenous uh, knowledge and indigenous medical practices, I think there is a well of a difference that can be made. That is, a small, small, it need not be always globally, like I mentioned in my question uh, about a SHINE project under International Space University, 2011 where they use a space platform to do the surveillance. But this COVID thing has given us an opportunity to go to surveillance level at the district level. Uh, way back in 2000, I remember in the Indian Social Science Congress, telemedicine was the focus. So you have to hurry up a bit. We've all yeah, I'm concluding, I'm concluding. I would like to look forward for uh, uh, taking clue from the best practices in the disaster management and pandemic situations and come out with some sort of a community empowered uh, telemedicine uh, options. That will be the new normal. It is going to give enormous opportunity, you see, uh, to, rather than going for the, 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 the medical curative cure, cure, approach. I hope you get my point. The curative approach is going to be a self-defeat to me in the new normal. 
this is my understanding. Thank you very much. Uh, who can take this up? Rajat, you want to take it up? Yeah, sure. Uh, so uh, I think we were not really, uh, as an industry, I don't think we were really prepared for taking on a public health emergency uh, that has happened now. Um, and there are a number of efforts that are going on, startup versus COVID and others that are basically trying to take on as a public health emergency and figure out what solutions companies like us, other entrepreneurs can put together to provide it. And one is where they have uh, basically facilitated uh, teleconsultation uh, for roughly 50,000 calls a day. Um, I think the project is called Step One. Uh, so I, I think there are efforts underway. Uh, there are, clearly at very, very initial phases. Um, and you know you, you have to agree that the situation has changed pretty much overnight for uh, the industry, where uh, on one end, we were being questioned whether teleconsultation is even legal. And there was a lot of pushback from doctors and consumers were very skeptical. Investors were not very sure whether they want to invest in the money or not. They were all taking these risky bets to suddenly you have a government that has approved it, uh, customers who want it, doctors who are agreeable to it, and then there's a pandemic on hands. So a lot of things are happening. I think uh, next three, four months, we'll have a better infrastructure in place to handle something subsequently, uh, something that will happen subsequently, because not at this scale, but at least a local, regional, um, Endemics have continued to happen, whether it's malaria or it, whether it's some other infectious uh, disease that has happened in India. So uh, I think we'll be better prepared uh, in the next few months than what we have been for at least this eventuality. Um, so uh, yes, there are projects that are going on. Hopefully, we'll have more things in play in the next couple of months um, that will allow us to be better suited are better prepared for handling what's going to come in the next one or two years during this pandemic. Sure. Uh, we have one final question coming from Ankita uh, before we conclude. You know, there is one question I've seen repeatedly that is coming up is on data protection of the patient. I mean, what are your views on it? Sort of, you want to uh, sort of, because, you know, I mean, would the data be open? I mean, what kind of data privacy laws do we have in place right now? So, you know, as I said, the data privacy laws for any, you know, online company is governed by Information Technology Act. Uh, there are certain data governing policies which are there as part of the telemedicine guidelines as well. So there are the two that I know. Uh, ultimately, what I can say is uh, patients data, data of the patient is patient's data and nobody else's data. And as of now, there is no interoperability between one platform to another. Right. So if you are seeing, uh, or if you are, you know, getting some reports or a discharge summary or some lab report from say a hospital X, and then you go to a hospital Y or even then you go to a doctor Z, then uh, the digital interoperability doesn't exist. Although, uh, you know, uh, some groups are working to, to come up with the interoperability and coming up with a standard of data, but uh, the privacy of the data is still in the hands of the patient and the doctor. So you as a patient are giving access and you are uploading it on a particular platform and that platform is, you know, the other doc other side doctor is also using. So I think it is good to right now see what data protection laws in the terms and condition, you know, of course, users don't have that much time to go through and, you know, read the TNC. We are, you know, mentally uh, sort of trained to just say, okay, while signing up, I agree to the terms and condition and privacy policy, right? So, so I think uh, that is something that uh, we as users are not trained. But I would say fairly, you know, responsible platforms, responsible, you know, doctors and responsible, uh, you know, hospitals, responsible software platforms as well, have taken up data privacy themselves uh, on a very serious note. And this is good for everyone because the fact that as an ecosystem, if everyone takes care of the data privacy, it exudes or infuses greater confidence among the system, which ultimately benefits the whole health ecosystem. 
so so there is actually incentives are aligned to protect the data of the user and uh, its system is sort of self regulated in that sense so just this sure. one point i would like to add there right so when you talk about data privacy right as sarav mentioned i'm sure rajat all of us are super serious and super sensitive about data privacy because end of the day we are digital health companies and mm-hmm. we are governed by the it right i mean then there is iso 27000 certification and all of that right now the questions that are being asked is specific to digital health companies i would turn around and say have has the consumer ever asked that question to a hospital mm. Mm. so if you if you walk into any hospital today i mean i'll give you an example of couple of hospitals i walked in where they have a storeroom of all the Recording. records yeah right and it's unlocked it's open right and and most of these hospitals don't even have an it or a security person right see so what i call uh, it security uh, contact person right they don't have any of those limitations right so when we are talking about data privacy it's yeah i mean we we are held to a higher standard and we will support it and we will actually stand by it but it's important to turn around and ask those questions to the existing systems which are like nowhere closer to what where we are i i agree i have gone to hospitals without uh, even a single computer in the entire hospital and there are like 100 bedded hospitals and um, also you know the concept of privacy as such is a very tier one concept right it's a concept for the audience who is speaking and who is hearing this uh, webinar um so because uh, we go to youtube and our doctor is giving a talk on pregnancy and other issues and uh, there there is a girl who posts a comment ki meri kal shaadi hai maine parson apne boyfriend se sex kiya hai aur mujhe main kya karu jisse usse pata na chale ki maine pehle se sex kiya hua hai and like first thing is youtube pe comment mat karo right and um, that's the base so the concept of privacy is not there people think online hai to privacy uh, hai and um, so I, i think if even if you look back or even if you look today to rural levels rural areas tier 3 it's still one room houses and dada dadi but हस्बैंड वाइफ और उसी में बच्चे भी पैदा हो रहे हैं उसी में सब कुछ हो रहा है तो द होल कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ प्राइवेसी मतलब वी वी ऑफ कोर्स टेक केयर ऑफ पेशेंट्स डेटा ओनली डॉक्टर एंड पेशेंट कैन सी दैट डेटा देयर इज नो वे एनीबॉडी एल्स हैज एक्सेस टू दैट डेटा बट आई एम जस्ट सेइंग द कॉन्सेप्ट ऑफ प्राइवेसी मतलब आर कंज्यूमर आर आल्सो नॉट दैट मैच्योर इन टर्म्स ऑफ डिमांडिंग फॉर दैट प्राइवेसी and the government um, has other reasons for it but ultimately i think it's going to go, go to the right direction it's just that um as an industry we are very far away from there or as a ecosystem the users doctors everyone yeah but there's certainly a need to uh, enhance it because that's what the customer would not want to be anonymous mm-hmm. that's yeah. uh, the patient would really not want his entire medical history out there with everybody yeah so, uh, so there are a couple of regulations that are coming and one is the telemedicine guidelines that came out right to protect the uh, individuals data privacy right then there is another uh, uh, guidelines that is being formed in terms of uh, data privacy which is specific to all the tele- i mean digital health companies right in terms of what information can be shared what information cannot be shared and then when we are talking about data privacy there are two sides of it right there is what we call personal identifiable information right kiran kiran phone number kiran mail id if i remove these three areas right any data that can relate to a medical information into a separate storage and and encrypted right then this anonymized information is is useless right right so, what is really important is to protect that personal identifiable information that actually says okay this record relates to kiran right mm-hmm. so so those level of security beefing up is already being done right for most of the companies sure um i see that ankita is here ankita would you want to ask your question sure uh, thank you first of all everyone for sharing your valuable perspectives with regard to 
HIPAA laws and all the security data. But I still would like to understand from you that how you are preparing your platform to manage scales, uh, keeping in mind patient uh, confidentiality and privacy laws. And uh, apart from this, are you thinking of involving any third party for security for securing data? And if yes, then how do you uh, think of tracking or auditing the compliance? So I, I'll just an answer this quickly and then uh, let my fellow panelists. So Ankita, from Ekin Care point of view, right? So we do get audited every quarter by an independent uh, consultant. So we are ISO 27001 certified. Uh, as we deal with large corporates and, and uh, tons of uh, privacy information. So there is an independent body that audits us, provides us a report every quarter and every year there is another audit that happens and every client that we work with from fortune 500 companies too they also audit us pretty much we are going through an audit pretty much every week or every other week okay. Okay. sure uh, saurabh you want to answer this i think this is what you know i there's nothing new new to add what i you know talked earlier about data privacy and security sure rajat yeah yeah so all the data you know, everything is encrypted with keys and uh, etc. So it's not that anybody can see the data between uh, what is happening between patient and the doctor. Uh, we haven't yet gone through the audit process as such. I think uh, it will be useful to go through that. But uh, as a process, um, in terms of scale, you know, uh, for technology products like ours, they have been built to scale. Uh, and to just give you an idea, we basically get roughly uh, 20 million visitors a month on our platform. We do roughly 300,000 consultations a month. Um, we get another 130 million on our video content uh, across YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, we power a lot of widgets across media websites as well. Um, which are providing COVID tracker and other trackers kind of thing. So the tech and product are already built for substantial scale. Rather, if there is any Hindi user um, in India, within six months, he would have seen my chart at least two times. Um, so um, it's already built for fairly substantial scale. And uh, think, of course, as the government guidelines come out, saying, okay, we need to do this, we need to do that. We will make sure that happens. Okay, thank you. Just one last question, especially for Karan. So I understand Ekin Care does share a large and good amount of data with their uh, corporates. So how do you uh, send this data? I believe it can't be sent on Excel. So do you have an interoperability uh, connection with CL7 or is it something else I would like to know? So, so on the, on the back end with the corporates, there is a separate dashboard that every corporate sees with respect to the population data, what I call population data, right? So within that population data, there, uh, all the PII information is stripped out, right? PII, I mean, personal identifiable information it's stripped out and only the anonymized population level insights are provided to the companies in terms of their population, right? And all this is, is going back and forth over an encrypted line, what we call HTTPS, right? Secure line. Sure. Um, so with this, I'm going to have to conclude it. We're already up short the time, but thank you so much. I think it was a very riveting uh, conversation. We've had our attendees still asking questions, but uh, you know, we're, uh, so this entire conversation is Facebook Live. And uh, if you have more questions, please put it there. I would request, I'm, I'm sure our panelists are very busy, but if you get a few minutes, kindly put in some answers from to the industry people. As, it's still a new field. And uh, you know, I would say people have a lot of inquisitiveness about it. But my uh, about few takeaways from the conversation we've had so far is that this is certainly telemedicine is here to stay and it is something that is going to be only growing going forward uh, because 
today, I mean, I think not just for the fear of COVID, but also for the reasons of convenience, for the reasons of uh, incentivization, as uh, uh, Saurabh had said, it's going to be much easier for me to get my regular ailments uh, done from through telemedicine instead of actually going all the way and visiting a doctor and then waiting in the OPD uh, for him or her to address me. Uh, secondly, of course, data privacy, as we've discussed it, is going to be very, very important. We have seen cyber hacking and we have seen lots of uh, loose data, uh, looseness in data protection, uh, which needs to be addressed by the platforms themselves to make sure that the customer, the patient is covered. And I think thirdly, uh, going forward, we have right now from what the panelists have shared, there have been some streams where there have been more telemedicine streams like uh, common cold or common ailments or dermatology. But going forward, you know, one could see a lot more rise in uh, what the patients go for telemedicine for. And I think it going forward, only platforms are going to enrich themselves uh, by adding more doctor force and everybody so that the telemedicine can become an easier tool. And I think lastly, I would say it's the doctors who themselves have made the change to the entire ecosystem. They are now forthcoming and ready to be part of this digital or the virtual healthcare um, sort of uh, advisory. And therefore, uh, this platform is likely to increase. You know, once the doctor comes in, his customers are bound to come in. They're not going to go anywhere. So this, which means that really the whole telemedicine structure, whether it's in big cities or small cities, it's only going to grow. And this sector, which we probably first time talked about, I mean, an entrepreneur, we probably, you know, talked about it as a subject for the very first time. But I think the more discussions, you know, I see that uh, the, the panelists, tell, uh, the delegates telling me that we should have more discussions on this subject. So going forward, we'll probably have more such discussions. Thank you, Saurabh, Rajat, Kiran for joining us today and enriching us. Please join us on, uh, uh, these are our Facebook pages and also all of our other social pages on Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn. Please join us over here and ask your questions. In case you have more questions, in case you have more sectors you would like us to cover at Entrepreneur, we'll be very happy to bring them forward. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.